Welcome to our service at Christ United Methodist Church. We're going to start with our scripture lesson, which is Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 31. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. And yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world run, runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you as well. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of your mouth be our daily bread, and may the leading of your spirit become our way. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, we're continuing the series, Questions Jesus Asked. We've looked at what kinds of questions there are, into the ramifications of Jesus asking, who do you say that I am? And then last week, why are you afraid? Today's question is similar, but not the same as last week's. Jesus' question for us this week is, why are you anxious? Anxiety or worry can cause a physical reaction to something we fear, but being afraid and being anxious are different things. In a general sense, fear often causes a flight or fight response, while anxiety or worry can leave us stuck where we are, unable to move. As we look at this week's scripture, it's helpful to understand the context given by the passages coming before what Nancy read. There were other discussions of wealth and possessions and what is truly necessary to maintain life. Jesus, I think, had a problem with the way some folks perceive that. The two verses right before really set the stage for the conversation we did hear earlier. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Did you really hear that? Life is more? As our lesson begins, Jesus lists some things he wants the disciples to consider. That is, to think about to pay attention to. For example, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? You know, I had, I'd like to ask Jesus, why ravens? Because ravens are no one's favorites, then or now. In Jesus' day, folks couldn't even use them as a source of food. And now, as then, they are still noisy, messy scavengers. But the scripture says, and yet God feeds them. It's almost like I can hear Jesus saying, maybe even with a hint of humor or sarcasm to get their attention. Come on, guys. 
If God even takes care of those nuisances, don't you understand he'll take care of you? What you worrying about? But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep seeking what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying. Hmm. You of little faith, do not keep seeking, do not keep worrying. What is Jesus' point here? You know, I have to say that worry is a pretty universal human condition, as old as time. David was a man after God's own heart. And all you have to do is read the Psalms to know that David dealt with a lot of anxiety. We're told that Elijah and Jeremiah walked through seasons of unrest and worry. And yet they accomplished much for the Lord. I was out walking recently. And I noticed a man, a little boy, maybe four or five years old, walking and talking, just a fun early morning stroll. But then I saw the little boy yanking on his dad's hand, obviously wanting to go in a different direction. And then I heard him say in a trembling voice, Daddy, there's a dog over there. That was a tiny little puppy, as cute as it could be. And the elderly gentleman walking it kept saying to the little boy, he won't hurt you, son. He's very friendly. But the little boy just cowered. And I wondered, how is dad going to handle this? Well, he knelt down to the little boy's eye level and said, I know you're worried about the dog, but it's okay. Just hold on to my hand. I've got you. That little boy leaned hard into his daddy, and together they walked right by the dog. I don't know the circumstances. Was it a long-standing trauma, a deep-seated fear of dogs? But in that moment, dad didn't try and talk the boy out of his worry. He didn't shame him about it. He didn't try to minimize it by saying, oh, come on, it's just a little puppy. No, he simply reassured that little guy that they'd get by that dog together. I watched them go on, and before long, that little boy was skipping along, chattering happily to his dad, and they were once again enjoying their walk. In situations like this, when we seek to simply reassure our children or maybe a friend, we're not chastising them for worrying, for doing something wrong. We're saying, my son, my friend, it's going to be all right. I've got you. I'm right here. Now, even so, being human, it can be easy enough to reason that maybe we aren't good enough Christians, that maybe our faith isn't strong enough. We can shame ourselves for worrying, and sometimes society just piles on more worry, stigmatizing how we feel. But here's what I think. No, here's what I know. Anything that evokes shame isn't from God, because God is love. Just think about that daddy loving his little boy past that dog. Now, I also don't believe that God wants us to feel helpless in the face of our worry and our anxieties. When he says, and which of you by worrying can add a single hour to your span of life, he is saying that it's not helpful to keep worrying because worry does nothing to help us. However, it might help to bring our cares to him. Not worrying doesn't mean ignoring whatever is going on. When we bring our worries to God, this helps form the habit of seeking him instead of seeking our own solutions or dwelling on all those possible what-ifs. Bringing our worry to Jesus helps us stop worrying. 
and do not keep seeking. For it is the nations of the world that seek all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Now, Jesus wants us to have our priorities straight. God will provide his followers with the necessities of life needed to fulfill his purposes in our lives. That purpose is or should be our priority. That is to have trust in God, in his provision. We should have our focus fixed on his kingdom, which in turn should make us want to share that kingdom generously with our neighbors. Now, there are some concrete ways of handling our anxiety. When I think of handling my own anxiety, one of the things I am most grateful for is a simple gift of breath. Ironically, this was even true before my current issues with my breathing. The word for spirit, ruach, in Hebrew is related to the words for air, breath, and wind. The wind of God hovered over the face of the deep at creation. The breath of God filled the nostrils of the first humans. The winds of God touched the earth at Pentecost and created a new living community of believers. Throughout history, Christian mystics have believed that the simple act of breathing was in itself a participation in the presence of God. When it comes to dealing with our anxieties, one of the best things we can do is focus on our breathing. Now, those Christian mystics also used what they called breath prayers as a simple but effective spiritual discipline, a practice using breath to soothe and, re and relax. They believe that in those moments of taking breath in as prayer, the spirit of God is most fully recognized. Now, I know those for whom this does not work well, but that's okay. We're all unique creatures. For myself, however, this is something I've practiced for a long time, ever since the early days of losing Harold when I couldn't seem to concentrate enough for long formal prayers. There were nights on my bed when all I could manage was a single word, help, which I have to say turns out to be a very fine prayer. I had no doubt that God heard that longing and intent in my heart just in that one single word but during the long days alone when I was weighed down by anxiety because I just couldn't seem to envision a new and different future for just myself I'd come right to the edge of a panic attack I found the quickest way to get myself squarely in God's presence was a simple breath prayer. Breathing in and out gave me a bit of control, and the simple prayer was immediately heard, and my God of comfort was right beside me. And I did start out simple. I found a beautiful image of lungs with instructions to just pray the word Yahweh, an ancient and revered name of our Lord repeating the first syllable on the intake, filling my lungs with air, and then with a slow release, repeating the second syllable, Yahweh, over and over, like an invitation to God, until I felt my whole body relax into his presence. So simple, but I can't begin to tell you what it meant to me at that point in my life. Since then, it's been a practice I use regularly, at home, in the car, at work, when I find the day spiraling out of control. Then maybe I'd use something on the intake like, let me know your peace, 
and then exhale, most holy God. You can use a scripture or any phrase which has an element of comfort for you. The simple act of breathing is a reminder that like lilies and ravens and all living beings, including us, are connected to one another and to that spirit who gives us life, knowing when and how to use our breath can be a solution that we can be very grateful for. Now, gratitude in and of itself is another way of making sense of our worries, a way of working to maybe get past them. Diana Butler Bass, in her book, Grateful, The Subversive Practice of Giving Thanks, says, to be grateful in a spiritual sense is to acknowledge the unmerited favor of God, who gives us gifts of salvation, joy, provision, comfort, and hope without any expectation of return. Now, this is just what Jesus was expressing in his teachings today, isn't it? Provision, comfort, and hope. Gratitude, when expressed with wonder and delight, can transform our ancient, anxious moments into a comforting connection with God. Now, many folks find the Jesuit practice of the examine a good way of focusing on gratitude every evening. Looking back at your day honestly and acknowledging God's presence there and looking ahead to the following day with hope. Gratitude can prompt us to move from worry to action. John Wesley had a similar weekly practice each Saturday morning, conducting a personal gratitude inventory, which consisted of three questions. Have I allotted some time for thanking God for the blessings of the past week? Have I seriously and deliberately considered the several circumstances that attended them? In other words, is it possible that God was blessing me even when I was at my lowest point this week? And third, have I considered each of them as an obligation to greater love, and consequently to stricter holiness? Again, in other words, in what way is God blessing me, even though the, through the darkness and toughness of life, to be a blessing for someone else? Gratitude can lead us to do for others, to be a blessing for someone else. You never know when telling someone about what you're going through will be just the reassurance they need that they're not alone. Simply keeping a gratitude journey, journal can help. On days of worry, anxiety, discouragement, look back at what you've written. It might just jumpstart your weary soul in the direction of gratitude and reaching out to others. Action can be part of anxiety's antidote. To recap, God has given us power and initiative to meet potential challenges. Giving our worry to God can help spur us to action. Keep in mind, many things we worry about never happen. Remember to breathe and be grateful. Act on those things you can control and surrender to God those things you're unable to control yourself. Now, let me add that if the thing that you find uncontrollable is a long-lasting, debilitating kind of anxiety, please, please surrender that. You may not be able to control that on your own, but I promise you that the God of love who meets us where we are would encourage you because he has gifted many amazing therapists and doctors who can help. Christian counselors are available. You can be in love with God and Jesus and still need a gifted professional to help you manage things. 
I speak from personal experience. I have a wonderful Christian counselor and a loving God in my life, and I walk with Jesus every day. There is no shame from God in that, nor should there be a social stigma or judgment. Now, I found this passage to not be one of warning or rebuke. It's a passage about the love and character of the Father. We're his children, and he gets us because he loves us. And so Jesus' chat about worry isn't about our character or a lack of faith. It's about the Father being a Father, a Father who is also the Lord God Almighty, He who holds the whole world in His hands. Praise God for His everlasting, all-encompassing love. Amen.